Hi students, welcome to Fusion Law School. In this lecture, we will be providing you an introduction to foreign investment regime in India. This topic will be taught to you by Mr. Ketan Mukhija. Hello, good afternoon. So today we will be talking about foreign investments into India and giving a snapshot overview of the entire prevailing regulatory regime and framework within India. The five broad heads that we are going to discuss today, the first one being the overall scheme of the exchange control regulations in India, followed by the nuances and the key material principles under the regulatory framework, followed by a structural come functional analysis, which is basically for investment promotion board, how does it regulate the exchange control and the foreign investments into and outside India, followed by Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs, which also has a bit of regulation on certain investments, large ticket size investments into India, followed by some kind of a structural representation on the foreign investments within India. Now, let's discuss the first overall scheme of the existing regulatory framework. What are the legal and policy considerations surrounding the FDI, foreign direct investments into India? How does the government think while evaluating the proposals for say cross-border mergers, acquisitions or other restructuring transactions involving a foreign entity? And what are the nuanced or potential challenges that might arise during the course of such transactions and which therefore must be borne in mind by the lawyers? Let me give it some perspective now. If you open the master circular, if you start with the conceptual understanding of the foreign direct investment into India, we know that there are certain sectors in which the FDI is permitted under the direct automatic route, while the others are either prohibited and the third category is where an FDI is permitted under the approval route. What does it mean? So let's take an example of say aviation. Up to a certain extent, say 49%, investments into greenfield projects in India dealing with the aviation sector, not about, you know, operating an airline or airport, etc., but aviation manufacturing of planes, etc., is open under the automatic sector. That basically means that, you know, if I am a foreign player, I am entitled to invest into an Indian entity which has 49% of my shareholding into India without having to go to any regulator for any prior written approval. Over and above that, if I have to invest say up to 74 or 100%, it's allowed under the approval route. This basically means that I have to actually apply by way of a plain paper and a detailed application wherein the services of the lawyer comes in handy to the FIBB, which is Foreign Investment Promotion Board, giving the details of my investment. The summary, the nature and size of transaction, the kind of clauses or the understandings that I am entering into and my broad business plan, the budget, and the key concerns surrounding that particular investment. So now, how does the life cycle of a particular transaction, which is a simple plain vanilla transaction of equity look like? So assuming, you know, I'm the 49% partner with an Indian entity and entering into a joint venture of sorts, say in any sector whatsoever, defense sector, insurance sector, banking sector, retail sector, aviation sector, most of the sectors are being liberalized these days to a large extent. And how does the life cycle of a transaction look like? And why does the role of lawyers assume such an important one? The simple reason being that, you know, if you look up the RBI, which is the regulator in this field for exchange control, every day there will be some or the other press note or a notification or an AP, DIR circular, etc. It is being issued by the regulator and carving some modification, substitution, amendment, addition, etc. of the existing regulatory regime. Obviously, this takes into account the macro level policy, the monetary policy, the fiscal policies of the country and therefore the change is imminent and also imperative. Now, keeping in mind the kind of changes, modifications, etc. that are being brought about in the regulatory framework which is characterized by FEMA which is the Foreign Exchange Management Act. All these amendments come to that under the regulations also which are issued under the FEMA, the role of lawyers obviously becomes very important, material and significant. Coming back to the question, so if I am a 49% partner who is a non-resident, wants to make an investment or enter into a JV with an Indian partner or a strategic alliance entity, how do I go about it? Obviously the principles of the parties sit across the table, negotiate the broad heads of terms, arrive at something called a term sheet. 
Now, what is the term sheet contain? Term sheet is nothing but like a memorandum of understanding or a letter of intent. You know, some kind of broad understanding which may or may not be legally binding, which sets out the summary or the transaction contours, the broad nuances or the dynamic or the mechanics which are surrounding the operations, maintenance, management, administration, etc. of the joint venture vehicle. Now that vehicle can be formed in any way. It can be a you know, general partnership. It can be an SPV which stands for a special purpose vehicle. It can also be a simple JV entity like a private limited company. Or nowadays we have limited liability partnerships also under the LP Act. Or it can assume the form of uh, an association of persons or a simple consortium. Whatever the structure may be involved, you know, because of taxation, commercial, technical, whatever other reasons is. Then we sit down and talk about the management of that particular entity which is formed as a result of the joint venture. The third part is, you know, regarding the exit, regarding the dividend distribution, regarding the turn of capital. So basically, if I am bringing in X amount, what is the internal rate of return that I am getting out of my investment? So after a year, obviously, I'll nurture some aspiration that, you know, my X amount will become X plus 1, X plus 2, etc. So all those dividend distribution, return of capital, valuation, waterfall, and other provisions are built into the term sheet. And finally, regarding the term and termination. So is it a project-specific kind of an SPV or a joint venture which is created? Say that, you know, ki yes, someone is coming up with a tender. We both have to participate in that tender and virtually read the synergies, maximum synergies out of the tender. So for that purpose, or is it an ongoing continual rolling process that you actually want to make a foray into? Now, obviously, once a term sheet has been signed, sealed and delivered, we'll enter into further negotiations, conduct due diligences, analyze the feasibility, come up with business plans, come up with annual budgets, come up with some structural and functional framework surrounding the transaction and our alliance and reduce that understanding into a definitive agreement. We can call it a joint venture agreement or a collaboration agreement or a cooperation agreement. Nomenclature is insignificant, but the essential core mechanics of our relationship and arrangements will be reduced into black and white by virtue and in terms of the joint venture agreement. Now, let's take a step back. What is the regulatory framework that we are supposed to actually comply with? The primary institutional body regulating the capital flows in and outside India is the Reserve Bank of India, as I stated. What are the capital flows as opposed to current flows? Current is something which is of a recurring nature. Capital is something, you know, one-time transaction, which is actually affecting a balance sheet, assets and liability situation in the financial statements of that particular entity. That institutional body is called the RBI or the Central Bank of India, which governs these inside and outside cash outflows. The government of India in parallel has constituted, obviously, you know, one of the key ministries is the Ministry of Finance, which houses the Department of Revenue, and the Department of Economic Affairs and the Department of Financial Services. So these are all departments, you know, and the Department of Economic Affairs looks into the proposals as and when dealing with the FDI. Going by the structure, the Department of Revenue also hosts the Central Board of Direct Taxes, which is the CBDT, DEA, which hosts the Capital Markets Division, CMD, you know, as we call it. And the DFS, so the Department of Financial Services, deals with all these financial institutions, you know, like banks, insurance, pension funds, and the respective regulators. Now, finance minister who heads the FIPB, he is the one who actually approves FDI on a case-to-case -case basis, which are there into the country. Now, how it typically happens is, if I'm a foreign player, I'll hire an Indian law firm and say, okay, fine, this is a summary of investment. Please get me an FIPB approval before we actually go ahead with our transaction. Obviously, the law firm collates and compiles the relevant information, which is basically in the form of the summary of the transaction, the couple of term sheets, etc., you know, broad nuances of the understanding that you have entered into and executed with the counterparty and come up with some rationale for approval of the particular transaction at hand and hands it over to the FBI. There's a systematic procedure. FIPB has its own regular meetings in which it actually evaluates and assesses the proposals on a case-to-case -case basis and thereby accords its approval or rejection thereon. Now, the other ministry obviously is the Ministry of Commerce, which hosts the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion. DIPP is basically responsible for promulgating, issuing and setting forth the FDI policy in India. Now, the FDI policy is basically contained in two things. One is the FEMA, which is the Foreign Exchange Management Act, which is regulated by the RBI, and the FDI policy, the FDI Consolidated Circular, which is typically issued on April 1 of each year by the DIPP. Now, 
the classic distinction between regulations and policy as we are all aware you know the policy is the framework or the underpinning on which the regulation is based and the regulation obviously is not a directive but has the force of law and has a binding value also that is contained in the FEMA. 99% of the cases both actually converge both are in tandem in sync and in consonance with each other however if at all there is an inconsistency or a conflict or some kind of contravention between the corresponding provisions under the FEMA and FDI policy FEMA will prevail and section 6 of the FEMA authorizes the RBI to manage the foreign exchange transactions in consultation with the Ministry of Finance. Moving on, the Banking Regulation Act, which is BR Act, and the Reserve Bank of India Act, RB Act, further provide and set out that the RBI with supporting authority will regulate the capital inflows and outflows in India. The RBI is the one which articulates the policy with respect to capital account transactions through regulations that must be then placed before the Parliament and notifications that require publication in the official cassette through circulars and press releases. So basically they take the form of a macro monetary policy and the fiscal policies in India which then get approved or disapproved by the Parliament of India by both the houses then take the shape of the law in which or in terms of which certain notifications and circulars and press releases are issued by the RBI and then incorporated, included and accommodated within the FEMA frame which is basically the exchange control framework. Now, as I stated that, you know, the number of press notes, notifications, circulars, etc. is so humongous that the RBI actually comes out for purposes of convenience on an annual basis, something called a master circular. What is a master circular? It's basically a compendium or collation or a compilation of all the communications by the Reserve Bank of India on a variety of subjects relating to capital flows such as FDI, ECB, straight credits, etc. What does it mean? Basically, it means that, you know, in cases of one of the regulations, which says transfer of security to a person resident outside India, which is under FEMA 20, there will be several notifications which are combined and together they consolidate into the master circular. Similarly, on external commercial borrowings, wherein the Indian residents actually borrow on an indebtedness basis, from foreign financial institutions or companies or eligible lenders, recognized lenders as we call them, that will be consolidated into the master circulars on ECBs, etc. This becomes very handy for the purposes of interpretation, reference and, you know, application of the law. Also, RBI regulation of various financial products is legitimized by the multiple authorizing legislations. For example, the RBI regulates derivative trading on currencies and exchange interest rates under the powers which are bestowed on it through the RBI Amendment Act of 2006. This was a key amendment by which RBI actually came out with various legislations or various subordinate legislations through which derivative trading on currencies was legitimized. Now coming back to the FIPB. FIPB being a part of the Ministry of Finance is chaired by the Secretary of the Ministry of Finance. It has been specifically set up and erected to expedite the approval process for foreign investment proposals. It is also empowered to and has been provided with the flexibility to examine all the proposals in their totality free of any predetermined parameters or procedures. It basically means that all the investment structures slash transactions which fall not under the automatic route but under the government slash approval route are supposed to be specifically empowered and approved and permitted by the FIPB. So basically it depends on the strength and the viability and the plausibility of the proposal that you give to the FIPB that it gets approved and therefore at this juncture the role of the lawyers becomes very handy. Now FIPB basically recommends with respect to the proposals not covered under the ambit of automatic route as I said but which involve an investment up to 3000 crores. Over and above these are considered by the cabinet committee on economic affairs. So there's a threshold, there's a kind of line which has been drawn up to which the FIBB can recommend and the MOF can then approve. If it's beyond the threshold, say 3000 crores in this case, it will be has to be also approved by the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. In addition to approving the transactions that are beyond the threshold of 3000 crores, CCEA, which is the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs, also reviews the economic trends on a continuing basis in the country and also the problems, the challenges, the prospects with a view to evolving a more consistent, integrated and consolidated economic policy framework. See, it comes out with the blueprint, it comes out with the white paper, etc., which takes into account all the suggestions, recommendations received from the industry players and accommodates the viable ones, puts it before the cabinet committee, whatever receives or not, 
becomes the letter of the law. Now let's move on to the diagrammatic representation. So basically for investments, bifurcated and trifurcated and multifurcated into various parts, foreign direct investments, foreign portfolio investments, foreign venture capital investments, other investments and investments on a non repatriable basis. These can be broad classifications, self-explanatory in which the investment can happen. We are focusing for the present time being on the first leg, which is the FDI. As we discussed, FDI can be bifurcated broadly into automatic and government route and basically talks about investments from persons outside India into India. Moving on, the kind of regulators that we have, RBI, SEBI and FITB. RBI regulates all the capital inflows and outflows and basically it is again divided into various kinds of investments and basically depends on the vehicle from which investment is routed through or the method of investment. For example, the investment can be in plain equity, Investment can be in convertible debentures, investment can be in hybrid securities, investment can be through debt securities, etc. That also changes the regulation correspondingly with which this particular transaction is going to be governed, regulated and played by. I think this flowchart is very important because it deals with the exact way in which the law is promulgated and assumes the force of the law and then implemented and also applied by the players like CBDT which is basically governed by the ITI, then DEA, DFS, DIPB, the way they actually promulgate and issue the laws, regulations, rules, whatever you call it, having the binding force. And then those are enforced among the industry players in that particular space through specific regulators like SEBI. SEBI takes care of the listed entities on the stock exchange. So if you are a public listed company that has to combine by obviously the RBI rules while making foreign investment and also the SEBI framework while doing activities on a daily basis. So therefore, the moral of the story is uh, the scope, the nature, the size, the method, the matter, the manner of investment of the transaction at hand has to comply with the letter of the law, which in a sense, when it deals with foreign investments is regulated by the Reserve Bank of India and depending on the nature of entity by the SEBI or the companies or the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, etc. So the whole promulgated or myriad of laws govern a particular transaction and it's very vital for the lawyers to know this law and obviously to ensure that it's applied consistently and in spirit. Thank you so much. I hope you learned something new from today's lecture. If you still have any doubts or queries about this lecture, please contact us on doubts at fusionlawschool.com. Hi viewers, to know more about us, please visit fusionlawschool.com or you can also visit us on Facebook, Twitter or Google+. Links are provided here. To stay updated, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button. If you like this video, please like, share and comment down below.